My name is Norman Neymark, and I have the pleasure today of standing in for Neil Ferguson as best I can uh, in this interview of Tomasz uh, Blushevich, uh, who is a Harvard PhD and a research fellow here at the uh, Hoover Institution. So we're going to have a conversation um, about his uh, fascinating work, which is about uh, Baltic seaports and corruption and how they uh, contributed uh, to the fall uh, of the Soviet Union. Uh, so Tomas, let me start with a kind of uh, basic question, which is how did you get into this fascinating work? I mean, after all, you look at a number of different seaports, you have to work in a number of different languages with a number of different cultures. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you come uh, to this subject? Yes, uh, if you read my uh, proposals when I was a graduate student, uh, and you might remember actually one of my proposals <laughs> because I, I submitted it here. Uh, I applied to graduate school at Stanford in 2011. My uh, proposal was uh, about something different. It was about the Polish recovered territories. Mm -hmm. it, it was about the new borders that Poland received after World War II. But then, of course, uh, when you're a graduate student, you, you get a chance to read a lot. You have a lot of time to think about what your research is going to be about. And uh, I remember in my second or third year, I just happened to discover a book uh, written by a Polish historian um, of the University uh, of uh, Warsaw. Uh, the book is called, uh, in Pol I'm not sure if there's a version in English, so I read it in Polish. It's about the black market in Poland under communism. And uh, when I read that book, I was like, wow, I thought I knew something about communist Poland, but this book just completely, uh, you know, opened a new uh, horizon for me. I mean, he just wrote about these phenomena from about the black markets and so on that you just don't, I mean, I knew partly about them from my upbringing. I knew, uh, I knew from, I knew about these phenomena from my parents' stories, right? But it was just the tip of the iceberg. And then I read his book, which is a very uh, well-researched book. The historian's name is Jerzy Kochanowski. And in Polish, the title of the book is Tylnymi uh, Drzwiami Through the Back Door. So delivering supplies through the back door. So I read that book and uh, especially the parts he had on port cities were just astonishing to me. It was like a true revelation. And I was like, I have to get to know more about it. Secondly, uh, because I was born in Poland and I moved here when I was 18, I didn't want my dissertation to be exclusively about Poland. I would never allow myself uh, to do that because it's a little bit like cheating, you know. I mean, it's a country you know very well, you know the language, so it's so much easier than, let's say, some friends I have, colleagues of mine that I really admire, born and raised in the United States and going to study as graduate students Central Asia. Yeah. For example, there was a, a colleague of mine, Maria Blackwood, also at Harvard. He's now, she's now working for the Library of Congress. And she actually went out to Central Asia for two or three years. Right? So I was very impressed by that. So I said, well, at least let me study Russia and Germany, which, of course, as a Pole and as a historian, you can't uh, really ignore. Mm. So that's how I expanded my focus just uh, to, to the entire Baltic uh, area. Yeah. Listen, I want to ask you something, and uh, I'm fascinated by the, these five years you spent in Tumen uh, from uh, 2017 to 2022, right? And, um, you know, very few people in the West have a kind of experience with Putin's Russia, I mean, that's closest to us. In other words, many of us spent time earlier in this century there working and working in the archives, and it was, uh, you know, a, a semi-free country, you could almost say. But things have changed a lot in late Putin's Russia. So how would you, I'm just curious, how would you, um, this isn't directly related to your work, but how does your time in late Putin's Russia kind of, you know, contribute to your understanding of the, mm -hmm. of the research, too? Mm -hmm. And what, what, what were some parts of it that, that really... 
um, you know, you would want other Americans to know about? First of all, uh, the college I went to work for in Russia was a special kind of college because it was English instruction only. It was based on a liberal arts model. It was run by uh, the director, uh, Andrei Sherbenyok. He received his PhD at Berkeley. Then he uh, was a fellow at Columbia for three years. So it was a kind of a Potyomkin village yeah. for our listeners, a kind of a show, uh, a kind of a, a, fo uh, a token. Uh, the, the Russians wanted, and I knew, knew about it when I came there, you know, the Russians, even in the Soviet times, the Soviet Union, even Stalin still wanted to have these um, you know, elements in his society that would suggest to a Western visitor that you know, they have democracy, that they have uh, uh, open society and things like that. So it's in that tradition and I knew about it. So it's a very, it was a very special project. So just that our listeners understand, it was not a regular uh, university in Russia, because there, I, of course, I would have to know Russian. So we were treated uh, differently. Right. And I could tell you a lot of stories about how the, let's say, regular, regular just meaning the state employed Russian professors, not, not as regular, not as extraordinary as us, just the state run uh, university where they were very distinguished professors, they were very jealous of our uh, position yeah. because we were treated, yeah. we had special rights. But then after three years, because uh, my Russian got much better, I was invited actually to teach at the ordinary university. Uh -huh. And there I had a chance to, to see the bureaucratic system, how much bureaucracy was there, incredible amounts. I was just swamped with paperwork. You know, most of, of my work there was what Russians called отчетность, which means giving account of your activities. Right. Right. Uh, so bureaucracy was we have some monstrous there. <laughs> no, you can't even, you, here you have assistants, you have, uh, you know, at Hoover we have, uh, for every researcher we have two uh, assistants, uh, you know, secretaries and research assistants. No, you can't even compare it. But about the regime itself, so I had no illusions about uh, the regime itself when I went there. But I still thought that uh, Putin would be a reasonable guy. I mean, I knew about all his, you know, uh, for example, the murder of Nemtsov, of Politkovskaya. I knew about what kind of a guy he was, but I th still thought that there would be some limit to uh, his uh, aggressive behavior. So in this sense, the invasion of Ukraine really came as a surprise to me. It was really a shock because... I mean, to all of us. Of I course, also but. felt slightly, if I can put it this way, I felt slightly betrayed by him. Because still, I went to work for Russia and I worked for kind of for the Russian state. I was you know, teaching uh, liberal arts courses to uh, Russian youth, right. for which I was reprimanded once or twice when I went too far, let's say, when I criticized Stalinism. But I felt betrayed a little bit by Putin because I, I thought he would be a reasonable guy, kind of like Brezhnev. Right. Right, that he wouldn't do something like that. And now, well, we can all see, and I hope the future will show clearly, it was a huge mistake uh, that he did. So that was a shocker to me. But there were signs of this coming, especially after Navalny's poisoning. I could see um, the oversight over the university increase. You feel that in two minutes. Yes, right? yes, the students would receive phone calls because uh, Russian students were very involved in, in supporting Navalny. They organized marches. Oh. There were many marches, especially when Navalny came back, he was arrested. That's, I think, January 21, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there were marches in many Russian cities. And my wife's brother, for example, he was a student. And he would, and he wanted to go, and he received a call from the administrators. If you go, you're gonna have there. There will be consequences uh, up to uh, removing you from the university. There was also increased uh, oversight over our research. Um, I applied for a few grants, for example, and and they were rejected. I think on the grounds that you know they were not patriotic enough uh, and things like that. But. But uh, definitely not until very close to the war did I feel this kind of cold breath of, uh, of the regime. No, I must say, I, I, up until then, I lived a pretty carefree 
life as much as, much as I could, and maybe it doesn't sound <laughs> that great because I was not actively engaged. I want also the listeners to understand. I was not actively engaged in supporting the Russian opposition the way I am right now right. in any way because this would automatically lead to deportation right. and right. the doors would be just closed. Right. So I was not engaged in that. Uh, I was trying to do my job the way I was trained at Harvard and New Chicago. That's what I was focusing on and I think uh, I'm still in touch with many students who, by the way, are now, thanks also to my recommendation letters, are able to study in Europe, something I'm kind of fond of. They are able to study at master's programs in, in Europe. So yes, the regime was there, but up until the war, it was kind of in the background. But yeah. then it suddenly came into your life with full force. I hope one day you write something about your experiences. I plan it'll to. Be, it'll be very interesting. And I can see, you know, from the from this work that you're now doing on the Putin era, that a lot of that, you know, has some influence on it. So that's, uh, that'll be very beneficial. Right, so just, 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 if I can just finish my thought here, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. I guess I underestimated Putin. I under, underestimated his resolve. And I also think he has changed during COVID. He, uh, he if you listen to his speeches, there's so much of uh, old style Soviet propaganda, even my wife tells me, you know, in the 2000s, he was all about, you know, opening to the West, uh, you know, free markets, you know, uh, Russian people could go everywhere, travel freely. He, his rhetoric was completely different. And now he has this, right now, his rhetoric is kind of doomsday rhetoric. Yeah. He switched to that. So this was shocking to me. Uh, I don't know. No, uh, I mean, I, I feel yeah. exactly the same. So yeah. I think your perceptions, you know, are at least from the outside, sound, sound the right to me. Anyway, let's return to your work a little bit. There, there, are two, there are two strands of it that are very interesting. One is, well, the one that's the most, in some ways, um, salient is this, you know, kind of subtitle you have about the Hanseatic League and about the Hansa and the revival of the Hansa uh, in the Baltic. And, you know, the way these ports work together in this kind of corruption and, um, uh, you know, KGB. But also establishing uh, trade links. And trade links, right. Between, right, between, uh, them. between them that, you know, where they were labeled corrupt by the Soviet regime because they were outside of the centrally planned economy. But... Um, no, they were just uh, trade links and people brought goods that were in demand in one place and, you know, what traders have been doing for millennia. Yeah. So uh, there was an element of corruption in the Soviet institutions that were supposed to police these activities and liquidate them. Right. But for many reasons, they always failed to liquidate them fully. And actually, as I demonstrate in my research, they grow in the 70s, 80s and then become this explosion that I call return of Hanseatic League, by which I mean the return of, for example, the Baltic Republics to this uh, organic um, European trade system, not just trade, but also political system right. and so on. So is there anything left of that except for, uh, uh, I mean, there's probably a lot left of that except the Soviet Union is not part, I mean, Russia is not part of it. Is, is, is that correct? I mean, so my dissertation that you mentioned, return of the Hanseatic League, right also applied to Russia to some extent. Right. Because Russia in the 90s, even St. though- St. Petersburg was yes, involved in all this, right? St. Petersburg was there, even though it was control, controlled by uh, not 100% ethically <laughs> clean businessmen, it was becoming a part of the European uh, network. And you asked about Putin's regime. Actually, what surprised me the most is that they were willing to go so far as to destroy the links they've built with for example, Germany, in terms right. of trading with right. gas. Right. I mean, this was a huge investment. So uh, the way direction Russia was going uh, in the 90s and, and up until Putin's second term, I think up until uh, Crimea, annexation of Crimea, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't suggest that suddenly Russia would uh, completely isolate itself from the, at least the Western trading community the way it did in the last year. So Russia was there in the picture. Uh, Russia was there. They had great cooperation with Finland. Yeah. Um, they had good relations with Finland and initially with the Baltic states as well. The Baltic ports were used by, by the Russians to, to trade. So it all started disintegrating, I think, in uh, 
what Robert Service called uh, the second coming of Putin after after Medvedev's uh, first term, so in 2012. So you worked in these uh, you worked in these um, uh, various archives in the Baltic uh, the Baltic region, uh, including um, you know Saint Petersburg, and um, you also in this most recent work where you're carrying some of this forward into the Putin period. You know, um, what, what would you say? You're almost on the edge of journalism. So, you know, you mentioned mm -hmm. Catherine Belton's work. It's a wonderful book, and I, I quite agree with you. Um, and other people who have written about the more recent times. I mean, how do you think, you know, as, a, as an historian about, about you know, w where things cease to be history, or do they cease to be history, <laughs> or how do you... Uh, you know, how do you, uh, for ex let me give you one example from your, your paper today, which was uh, about Subchak and in the speculation that he was actually murdered by uh, the KGB, um, which I did not know, uh, I had not heard about um, in, I think you said in, in uh, Kaliningrad, Oblast, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so where, where, where do you find the lines where you feel comfortable as an historian, where you don't, where you think you may be, mm -hmm. you know, becoming more like Catherine Belton, who is a <laughs> journalist, and, 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 and what are those lines, and how do you think about that now that you're doing this more well, recent history? I didn't, didn't expect that question, <laughs> uh, but first of all, uh, our knowledge about late communism, Okay, let's make a short pause here. I'll just say it again. What we need to understand is that our knowledge about the late Soviet system is limited in terms of archival uh, evidence, right? So that's why these Lithuanian archives that I work with that are held here at Hoover are such a treasure trove because they show you a little bit of that system and you, you don't have it. We had a little bit of it in the 90s. Right? Some archives were open, and of course the GARF and other big archives are open, so we have some access to party materials, but not the KGB. So that's where, that's why, and that's where a historian encounters difficulty, because then you have to rely on non-standard methodologies, such as oral history. Well, it's, it is a standard methodology, but, uh, but the second thing I want to say is that no, you are right, and I, I, I mean, actually, I can return the question to you, is how, <laughs> what you would say counts as history in terms of the time it needs to pass between the events and the historian looking, looking at it, right? Because for me, as a person born in 87, communism is like dinosaurs. I had no personal exposure to it, and I still remember when I was a kid, maybe I was six, seven years old, and I, uh, we were driving in our car with my parents in Poland, and there was like, you know, it was a long drive, three or four hours, and somehow I asked them, mommy, daddy, tell me, what is this komuna? Komuna is just a pejorative way Polish people refer to communism. And they went on on a three hour long monologue, and I remember that day I was just like, wow, it's like outer space, it's such a weird system. So that to me is history because you know, there's enough of a generational gap. Even yeah. though I have access to, still my grandparents are alive, so they still remember World War II, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't think uh, we would reasonably say today that you know, studying World War II is not history enough. Mm -hmm. So it's always a matter of degree, but here in the case of Russia, I would say, because it's becoming a closed society again, then it's like historians are like Kremlinologists in the 80s. You have to build your knowledge or your, I guess your hypothesis based on very non-standard sources. Because Russia is not a country like the United States where let's say 30 years passes and the Central Intelligence Agency has to reveal the records or 50 maybe for very uh, secret, top secret uh, materials. Russia is a country where you never know what kind of sources will be available, so you have to rely on, on non-standard things. But of course, uh, my dissertation is more historical. The paper I presented for our workshop here, well, one thing I want to do is um, encourage the readers to study late communism because the roots 
of these phenomena we see are there and how do I convince them that they should study this arcane world of Soviet black markets or Leningrad? Well, I tried to uh, demonstrate that some of those figures who had their roots in that world are currently uh, at the helm of Russia. And it's just one reason why you should study them. But my historical intervention is not there. It's not in establishing Sapchak's murder. My historical intervention is in the 70s and 80s. Right. So this is just a kind of a contextualization. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tomas, for your presentation today. And uh, we're really looking forward to the, um, uh, you know, the publication of your book, which will be an exciting moment. And it's very nice to talk to you again. It was and, my uh, we'll do honor it again. and my pleasure. Okay. Thank you, Professor Nymark. Thank you.